What's going on, everybody? And thanks for tuning back in to another episode of Florida Prison Talk. I'm your host, Easy Win. Listen, listen. If you just tuned to the page, my name is Easy Win. It's called Florida Prison Talk. But a lot of my material is based off of New York. I moved to Florida in 1994 from New York. I'm from Westchester County, 914. I moved from New Rochelle. I was living in Hartley Housing Projects. My, my dad came and got me. My mother's side still stayed up. My mama stayed up there. My sister stayed up there. My brother stayed up there. We all had different fathers. So my father came and got me. You know, even though the rest of my brothers and sisters consider my dad their dad, my dad was from Florida originally. So he used to come to New York every summer to caddy at a golf course called Wingfoot. Some of y'all probably familiar with Wingfoot. It's in Mamaroneck. A lot of people come from the city. New Rochelle, Mount Vernon, Yonkers, everybody caddied at Wingfoot from different cities. So that's how he met my mama. And I came down to Florida. And, um, because a guy put in the comments yesterday, you should call this New York prison talk. And I was like, I know, right? He probably, he probably wanted me to argue, like, yeah, leave me alone, whatever. No, I shouldn't. But it, it, was, it was funny to me. And um, so I started my page off of interviewing people that have been through the Florida State Department of Corrections, specifically the JIT camps and stuff was my most interest. And um, then as, as I started building my YouTube page, I started going on Instagram doing some research and stuff. And I started interviewing a lot of Dominicans. The Dominicans have a lot to do with my page getting the subscribers. The Dominicans were showing a lot of love. When I was interviewing the Dominicans, my views was through the roof every time. I need to get back in the algorithm. But yes, my family is from Westchester, 914. You know what I'm saying? Tatted on me right there. And I got 561 Florida tatted right there. Um, my family is from, like I said, I left New Rochelle, Hartley Housing Project. I lived in 81. That was in the building number. 4F. That's where I lived at. And, um, but my family is, my, my immediate family is in Yonkers. My mother, my sister, my nephews, my nieces, they're all in Yonkers. My brother called his case in Yonkers. And um, so those are the four basically cities, the Yonkers, Nourishell, Mamaroneck, and Mount Vernon. A lot of my family stays in Mamaroneck. A lot of them stay in Mamaroneck, but my immediate family is in Yonkers. But my first cousins and all that, my aunts say a lot of them in Mamaroneck. My uncle just passed away. He was living in Mount Vernon. My dad lived in Mount Vernon. We used to come down there. I've been through all through Mount Vernon, all of that stuff. So I know those four places very well. But um, for this video right here, we're going to get into my little cousin. I did an interview. I, I know all the interviews I did with my brothers. Yeah, I know the one I did with my uh, my homeboy, Kells, about being a crip. And the other one I did was my nephew. I just said a family member, at the, family member at the time, but that's my nephew that I did the other video on, being a crip in the New York State Department of Corrections. This video is on my little cousin. Real young, he, um, let me just give you the backstory how this incident occurred. He was at one facility. He got into it with, um, and he, his bid is small. Like he has a, he has a short bid. I think he has like a one to three or something. He has a short, like a short bid. Anyway, um, what happened was he was at one jail, you know what I'm saying? Cause like, it's hard for, it's, it's just hard for them to live in with these jails with, with the organizations he's in. He's at one jail. You get what I'm saying? And he, had, he got into it with another a person with, um, got into it with a blood. So they got into it, whatever. Well, when they got into it, surprisingly, the, the COs didn't find out about it. It was like, I don't know if you call it sanction. They went at it, though. They went at it in a, in a separate part. So when they was done, nobody got in trouble. You get what I'm saying? But long story short, after that, my little cousin ended up getting, a, getting into something else and got transferred. He got transferred to a different facility. But when he gets transferred to the uh, different facility, the guy he got into it with must have got transferred before him. Because when he got there, the guy was already there. And I guess when you come to a new jail, because he said the guy was talking, they ended up in the same dorm. The guy kept saying, oh, we got a bandit. We got a bandit. I guess a bandit means when you go to a new jail and somebody you have problems with, that's called a bandit, I guess, in the New York State Department. of I know it's called a bandit. Because I interview people that said that in the New York State Department of Corrections. And I was like, I'm saying to myself, okay, but why, why, what's up with the keep away? There's no keep away if none of the parties tell on each other. So if the, if the administration don't find out about the, the fight they got into and they go back to their dorm, there's no keep away. Nobody told on each other. He gets there. He sees his bandit there. He like, dang. But he's trying to see how to, he's trying to check the, the, the temperature of the dorm and stuff, see how things is going. And it kind of rocked him to sleep, he said, because they was acting like everything was good. They acted like everything was good. And, um... The, the facility he's at, they have cubicles. They have cubicles. You know what I'm saying? And um, his, his cubicle happened to be by the guard. 
like right by the guard station or whatever. Listen, these dudes came from a whole other dorm. It was three bloods. Let me tell you how they did it. It was, it was really articulate the way they did it. Now, the guy kind of fumbled with it. The guy that did the cut and he kind of fumbled, but the way they brought him was kind of articulate. I don't know if this is what they always do. They came with like two or three people. They went to his cubicle and they stabbed him in the side of the face. They didn't even get him like they should have, he said. And this is the thing about it, though. And it's crazy. My brother just went through this stuff months ago. Anyway, um, this is the thing about it, though. When they caught him, it wasn't even a deep cut. Like, my little cousin said they could have finished him. They were standing over him like, he's assuming they were standing over him before they did it. Like, and just, they could they could have stood over him. They could have studied his body and then cut him. He said they basically fumbled. But what was so ironic about this is that after they cut him, he jumped up like a jack in the box and he's chasing him. But the dude that cut him passed the dang on, he passed the knife off to something else, somebody else. So now my little cousin is fighting this other dude. Pop, 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 pop. They going at it. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, bang. They going at it. Get what I'm saying? But meanwhile, his face is cut. So now the COs come. The CO wakes up. They break it up. My cousin's getting the best of him. He's on top of him getting the best of him. They break it up. And they give my cousin the ticket. They give my little cousin the ticket and like, and I hate he even going through this, man. He was, his youth was just gone, man. He was, he was such a good kid. Anyway, um, so now when he's fighting the other blood dude, it's looking like they were just a fight. It's like no weapon in sight. Like, oh, no, nah, that, that didn't come from no stabbing. That came from, from me punching him and stuff. So it's making it look like it was no weapon. It's like the wound came from fighting. But long story short, they gave my little cousin a ticket for that incident and, um, and I can't make this up, man. They gave my little cousin a ticket. And the blood dudes got away with it. They did absolutely nothing to them. It was like almost like these blood dudes was victims. And they end up transferring. They end up transferring my little um, cousin to another facility. Because he doesn't stay at facilities long. Like, he does not. He does not stay at these facilities long. But when he got to this facility, even though the bandit was there, for some reason, he still was thinking that things was gonna be okay. You get what I'm saying? He still thinking things gonna be okay. Cause I wasn't gonna mention this. Cause first of all, it was a dude from the town that was there. The dude from the town was there that, that he knew. It wasn't, they didn't rock up under the same umbrella, but the dude from the town was, um he was actually a, a neutron. He was a neutron, but he was, he got weight in there. Like he hold his own, like they know him. Like he, he's good money. So he was, they, I don't know if they rocked him to sleep or they just said forget it. But he was, they wasn't messing with him for a few days. And I guess the the power that the dude from the town had wasn't really super duper strong because they still went at him. And the dude from the town, um, my little cousin didn't get into it whether the dude was close to him or not. But I don't know how that's supposed to work. Tap in the comments if you know how it's supposed to work. Like, the dude is from the town, but he's not in the same organization as my little cousin but he's from the town. And that dorm is full of people from the from the bloods. So was that dude that was from the town, was he supposed to help my little cousin? Or was he supposed to just sit back and watch so his time don't be worse? How does that work? You get into it with some people, you see a dude from the town. <coughs> <coughs> the dude from the town does not gang bang, but you see this gang, um, you see you getting busy with this gang, is he supposed to jump in? And if he doesn't jump in, are there repercussions when he get back to the town? Or is it just, hey bro, I know how it go, man. You all right. How does that work? How does that work? My little cousin about to come on. He had, he had like a, um, he had a one to three, man. And um, he's been going at it the, the whole one to three. He's been going at it, man. And this is crap, like, I love doing these videos, man. But this shit just gets me so pissed off, man. Like, what are we doing, black people? What are we doing, man? No, I'm not. I'm not one of those motivational speakers that, like I said, this page is not designed to keep kids out of jail. If you help you get out of jail, so be it. But like I always tell y'all, as I close this one, and I'm gonna be doing, I'm gonna be doing um, more. I'm gonna be doing 
more videos of my little cousin. And I'm gonna when he come home, I'm gonna actually interview him. This just, I just don't be understanding it, man. I understand it, of course, but it's, it seems so, it seems so stupid to me, man. That that blacks are, blacks are hurting each other like that. And this is what I have not. This this one thing I don't understand. Crips can't live in the same spot as Bloods, and Crips is a black gang. But the Spanish gangs can live with the Bloods. How does that work? Spanish gang can live with the Bloods all day, but a black gang like the Crips, they can't live with the Bloods. Like, tap in the comments if you think some of this stuff don't make no sense, man. Tap in the comments if you think some of this stuff does not make any sense. And the good thing, though, about my little, he has a lot of support. He gets, um, he's never hurting for money. And he's a real humble dude. Yes, he is in an organization. But he's a very humble dude. He's just saying that everywhere he goes, it's hard to live. And that's so weird to me because I heard way back in the day that Bloods couldn't live in certain facilities. So I'm thinking, like, is this the get back? Like, you know, um, when the Bloods first came out in 94, was the Crips already out? Like, when you hear about the Rikers Wars and stuff with the Bloods and the Latin Kings and the Bloods and the Nietas and the Bloods with the Dominicans, I never hear anything about the Crips and the Nietas, the Crips and the Dominicans. I never heard of Rikers War with the Bloods and Crips at Rikers War and at Rikers back in the 90s. We always hear about the Bloods and the uh, Latin Kings. Was the Bloods and Crips getting busy with each other back then too? Or did that come later? You know, um, it just, hey, listen, y'all make sure you hit that like and subscribe button, man. It just, it just breaks my heart, man, to see that people got to go through this. Cause you know, and he sent me a picture. He sent me a picture um, of him on a visit. And I'm going to be honest, when I seen that picture, my little cousin, it's like all the youth from him was gone. Like, I remember him being a youth. It's like the youth was gone. His face was like hardened, like tough. Like, it's crazy to me. Another thing I ask, I ask people like, if you've been in prison, especially as a crip, and you see all of that stuff you got to go through as a crip, can't live in certain places, bloods everywhere. Everywhere you go, you gotta pop off in front of the captain. You gotta pop off in front of people, the administration, so that you can get out that jail. I say that to say this, why would you come home and commit another crime to end up back in that same place? Why, if you know, if you know as a crip, you have to go through all of that stuff when you get to prison, why would you come home and do a crime to lead you right back into that environment. I just don't understand it. And that's another thing I could say like, cause I visited a lot of dudes in jail, man. I visited a lot, I visited um, brothers in jail down in Florida. You know what I'm saying? I, I was going on, my homeboy was in jail. He was like, maybe like 45 minutes from my house. I was going to see him like at least twice a month. And one thing I learned about people in jail, man, when you're on that visiting room floor, when you're on that visiting room floor, all you hear from them is positivity. Positive, 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 positive. And then when they come home, it's a completely different story. I know people say, well, it's different in there because you don't have all the influences and drugs around you. No, no, no. This particular person had all the drugs around him. At Freewood, the facility he was at was lit. Was lit. And right, all of this good stuff. And then when you come home, you do the opposite. I can empathize. I did that when I was in my little fake incarceration. I was writing my dad's Bible verses. I even got them Bible verses tatted on me when I first came out. Man, I came home. I, I, when I, first, I didn't do it when I first came home because all the letters I wrote, I said, no, nah, I can't do this, man. When I first come, I can't do no coke. I can't smoke no weed when I first get home. I got to chill. I done prom made my, all these promises to my dad. I waited a little while, man. And then I decided to do it. And that's when I realized that all of those letters and stuff, none of that means anything until you hit that solid ground outside the prison facility. But I appreciate y'all tuning in, man. I'll be doing a lot of videos with my little cousin. He probably got, he probably got about nine more months left.